So I just want to start off. View 3. Love it. I love View 3. I've been doing, th uh, well, actually, View 3, but just View overall. I've been doing it the last three years, and it's really, really good framework that I've been using. I really want to talk more about it and let you guys know about View 3 coming up uh, there. One thing I like about Vue 3 is it's really easy to pick up. I bring in some grads into the company sometimes, and I've, I have, they have a very easy time kind of picking it up. Again, they don't have JavaScript experience, but they're able to kind of pick up, um, based on the structure of Vue, um, how it kind of works. Um, Vue.js has been kind of around the last uh, six years. So it's like uh, 2013 was the first version, like uh, 0.6. And it's been going since then. And Vue 3 is supposed to be released this quarter. Uh, but it's been held back at the moment uh, there. So state of Vue. Just to give you an update on it, I was hoping by this talk, when I submitted this talk, that Vue was, 3 was supposed to be released in the end of uh, 2019. So I thought by the time this came around, I would have all, everything done for you and showing you all the new features um, there and like pro, uh, code examples of it. So unfortunately, it's still in alpha stage uh, at the moment. Now, I have a kind of a guess that there's Vue Amsterdam in three weeks. They might release it there. I don't know for certain. But it's something that I think is uh, there. So it's still in alpha release and planned for Q1, they said. When they, upped, when they kind of missed it, they kind of said Q1. So, and then most of the RFCs are closed for comments at the moment. Uh, there. So. Um, as well, with, the, with it not being finished, the only kind of uh, version of it that's available at the moment is the kind of like the CDN version. So we import it into your HTML, and then you can kind of use the kind of JavaScript there. What we normally do and when we're programming it in my company is we use the kind of compiler, the Vue.js compiler. So we have our .vue files, and then we compile it. That's not ready because the Vue loader that understands that schema of that file is not ready. So again, the examples you see in the Vue repository is just uh, ones from when they import the kind of the CDN link. So it wouldn't be a thing without showing like how popular Vue is. Again, it's not the most popular, but I think it's kind of gaining traction. Um, how you kind of measure popularity in kind of uh, frameworks is kind of like up to yourselves. But I kind of picked it by like NPM downloads. So as you can see up here is the green one is that's Re uh, React, obviously the most popular one. But then you see down here is um, Vue. So Vue is kind of coming behind, behind React. And then you have like uh, Angular, Amber Source, and Backbone. So I think Vue is kind of getting more and more popular. Again, I think it's the ease of use of it. Again, graduates can kind of pick it up. Senior maybe infrastructure people that never did JavaScript before, I've seen pick it up very quickly. Like, so I, that's what I kind of like about it. Um, these are the kind of new features. There's loads more than this that they've introduced. And these are the ones I'm going to kind of go over uh, there. Um, so one thing about the, these kind of features and stuff you don't see is it's a smaller code base now. So they've released uh, the way they've kind of done it is they made it about 10 kilobytes now. So it used to be around 20 kilobytes, the core. And they've kind of like uh, brought it down a bit there. Um, there's better TypeScript support, which I won't go over here as well. Other features uh, that are there is kind of like time slice and support, static tree uh, host, hosting, and you know optimized slot generation. So there's those other kind of um, uh, features. But we'll kind of go through these ones here to kind of show you. Hardcore. The core, what I found through like investigating this and going through the RFCs is really what they've kind of done is they've brought in some plugins into the core of Vue.js. So that's the ones I'm going to go over. And then some of them, they've just, they were never plugins before, and they've added them as new features. So you can think of it, some of the features that are in Vue 3, you can actually do in Vue 2 at the moment. And then when Vue 3 comes out, it should be like an easy upgrade. So I never say easy. Well, you never say easy because there's always going to be some kind of problem, but it should be like easy enough to do. Like. So that's, I'll show you some of those as well. Though. So just for. Anybody? Actually, one thing I forgot to do. How many Vue.js developers are here? I just kind of want to know. Say 50, 60, 60 percent. Okay, that's good. Okay, Lisa's getting more and more popular. I forgot to ask that in the popularity uh, bit there. So just for the uh, the guys that are not Vue.js developers, this is what I love about it is the structure of it. So this is a single file component. 
And you've got three sections for a template, which all your HTML goes to, the script, where all your kind of JavaScript goes, and your styling. Again, when I show the grads or maybe the senior infrastructure team how to kind of develop, that's what I show them. And they can understand it pretty quick. Do you know? So this is a very basic one of it. And here you have, in your data section, your reactivity. So you have a thing called greeting, and the greeting will appear there. And that's your one web component. Again, it's very, very simple for them to understand. So this is like what I was talking about earlier, a compile time file. So Vue.js has to use Webpack to convert it into a HTML and JavaScript files then afterwards. So this is not what's going to appear on your kind of application. It's going to um, compile it for you. And this is not what's ready in Vue.js 3 at the moment to take in the new features that it's done. So. OK, so one of the big ones uh, there, one of the big features that came in, and there's a lot of controversy over it. I think people kind of got the wrong end of the stick straight away, is do you know the way there was the optional API? Now there's this competition API. Again, you can either use one or the other. In Vue.js 3, it doesn't really matter. Um, but I would start to use competition API for more bigger components. Again, we'll go through that. But um, it just really helps with kind of code reusability, and we'll kind of show that. So just again, for the people that don't maybe know uh, Vue.js here, these are all the kind of options. So this is the option-based API. And you have these different sections. You have like the, uh, the prop section, the data, the method, the computed components, watch, and mounted. And these are all the kind of things. This is really good, really structured. Grads understand it. You know, people that haven't done JavaScript before, they can kind of go, oh, I need to do a me new method. I do it in the method section. I need to do a computer property. I do it in the computer property section. Only issue with this, with this structure, as your um, components get bigger and bigger, it can't be, it's harder to maintain. And it's harder to reuse some features you might have in it. So you might have a method in here that looks after the greeting. And you have a message here. And they kind of work hand in hand, say. When you want to use that in another component, you can't extract both of them with the options API. So you can extract this into like the method into a JavaScript file. But then the other kind of the reactive data stuff uh, doesn't follow it. Or if you're watching the, the data property there, that doesn't follow it either. You can't extract it out, and that's the kind of issue uh, they had. And I've seen it in my own kind of programming and in own products that we make. Like some components I can't bring down far enough, and there might be parent components really. And the composition API is kind of going to solve that. Again, with some of these features, you're kind of like, I kind of knew about the problem, but then there's a solution. You're like, actually, that's the solution, okay? So, and it's really it's about like maintaining. That's all I want in the products is about maintaining and readability, making that high quality like. So the composition API again, I just took this from uh, View Schools, which is a quite a good uh, resource. You've seen before that uh, there was the different sections, export default, and there was the different sections in the options API. And now here you just have one uh, method called setup. And in setup, you can define any of your different um, your different functions that you want to use. So you can kind of like, what you do is you import reactive or computed. And you say, actually, I just want to do the um, reactive bit. And I want to do my method. And I want to return that so it's available in the template. Again, the thing is about this is like you define what you want. And you return what you want then. Big thing about this as well is this can all be an object from like line uh, 12 to kind of uh, 19. You can put that in a separate JavaScript file then. So you're kind of like having, you're monitoring your state of the account. You're also updating the account in one JavaScript file. So you can export it uh, or have it imported from a JavaScript file into your um, component. And then you can use it in every other component. So all the kind of properties are following each other, the computed and the watch. So that's kind of, that makes it a bit, uh, easier to maintain. You can also reuse that kind of pattern over and over again. Now, the only issue I find with this, and the thing we have with the options API, nice and structured, nice, nicely done. Grads can kind of, and senior engineers can kind of understand it quickly and implement it. And you can kind of do your code reviews quite good. With this, you can do whatever you want, anywhere you want. Again, within your own company or within your code, you have to come up with some pattern that somebody doesn't just put a method up here and then compute it and then another method and then reactive properties at the end. 
you know, you can kind of really create unstructured uh, patterns then. So with great power comes great responsibility on yourselves to kind of do that. And that's what I see maybe a problem in the future with it. Just to show you the difference, um, that it's, it's really the same. It's just another way of doing it. Again, you can either use composition or optional API there. Um, so again, we have here, we have money and delta. And they're reactive. And we get the, the, um, those functions from view. So exactly as well. So the one thing I couldn't do um, with the view at uh, three code base is get composition working. So I imported it from view two. Again, you can get composition in your view two application at the moment. So this is just my workaround for now. So what I can do is I can have reactivity, money, and delta, and I can that's it kind of maps to the options API there. I can also do computed, which then maps to the computed kind of uh, function in the option of the API. Again, they're all kind of following the thing. So it's the same kind of thing. It's just a different way and a different pattern of doing it. The only thing is I can export this, this section here, to here, to a JavaScript file, and call out a feature, and then import it into my uh, component. And then all I have to do is return uh, that object, and then it's part of the HTML then. And I can use that kind of functions in the HTML. So again, just with this as well, just to explain it with the composition API, everything you define, you have to return. So I have delta, money, there are two reactive properties. I have to return them to be reactive in the HTML. And then format and money is a computer property, and then add as a method, which I'll use in my HTML. So I have to return them at the end, and they're part of the setup, and that's all I have to do. Then. So that's the kind of composition, how they kind of map to each other. I think it's quite powerful. I think it's going to be a lot of reusability available on it. OK, this is another feature. Does anybody, has anybody paid Portal? Does anybody know what Portal is? OK, about half the crew. OK, so Portal is like you have a gun, you shoot the wall, yeah? And then it creates a, like, um, a portal, and you shoot the gun at another wall, and it creates a kind of connection between them, yeah? So I can jump in that portal, and I can peer up there. So sometimes you might want that in your, in your DOM, yeah? You want to want to define something when I'm coding in a certain section in the DOM or a web component, but when it renders, I want it somewhere else in the DOM. Do you know that kind of way? So I'll bring you through kind of idea. Again, this is useful for kind of pop-ups and modals and notifications where they're kind of like nearly at the end of the body sometimes because you don't want them interfering with the rest of the DOM. So, but really, when you're maintaining it, you don't want to be going up and down going, OK, this is the button that enables the modal, but then I have to go to the bottom page to kind of look at that code. But this allows you to kind of co-locate the information when you're programming. But when it's kind of uh, executing, then it uh, renders somewhere else. So I'll just show you a quick example. Here is a card class. And here I have like a button. And when I click the button, this section appears there. So that's fine. It's just a vshow. And vshow just tw uh, toggles the display CSS attribute to kind of none and show. So that's all it does. But I don't want this class, user class here, interfering with my, with my like, little section here. It might have stuff, the CSS, that I don't want to have it. But what I really do want is I want this section here located next to the button, because I want the grads to understand this button and this is connected. But really what I have to do, and if this is a modal kind of, if I had a class called modal, it, they might interfere with each other, or this class might interfere with it then. So I'd have to move it out of here and to the end of the body then. So that's what Portal does. It says, I can define it here. And this is the kind of idea, is I can define it in this nested kind of component when I'm programming. So and what I'm saying is the target. And when it's running, it actually appears somewhere else in the DOM. So I could say, here when I'm programming, this is the portal. And this is how JavaScript, or the Vue.js knows. It's wrapped in a portal element. And then when it's uh, running, it will actually, it's probably what it's doing is a very simple like um, find and replace. So it's going, find me all the portals, and then I'll replace them wherever they say pop up target. So you have to have that. So that's like your portal, like I shoot up the wall. That's my target. Um, that's my source. And then I want to move this to where the target is at the end of the room. So that's the kind of way it's doing it. Again, I never had that kind of, I did have that problem, but I didn't realize it until this. Again, this is available in Vue.js too through the uh, view portal um, API. But now it's part of the core. And when I was looking through the code, this is 
part of the uh, code already. So you can see there's three different types we would go through there. So again, this is just showing you that I can co-locate them now. So the, the problem I had two slides ago, I had a button, but I want to say this button enables this kind of, um, say, modal or, or a show. And then it will actually, wherever I've um, put an ID pop-up target, it will appear there in the rendered um, HTML. So that's what it's kind of solving. So yeah, so it's kind of, um, it's a handy feature, I think, as well. So keeping co-locating, getting it more maintainable, and people understanding, OK, this button, and this is the code that it activates. And then when it's rendering, you don't care, because it's just really uh, rendering somewhere else. Again, you can use it for other things, uh, especially there, like so. So that's the kind of portal feature. Suspense is another one that's, in core, uh, that's part of the core now. It used to be in Vue 2, I would use a thing called Vue Weight plugin. So the view weight is like, do you know when I fetch information, I want a loading kind of bar sitting there? Now they've brought that into the core, so it's part of the default thing. And this is a type that it understands Vue.js 3. So all I'm just saying here is this template, as soon as it's uh, ready, then display this uh, component here. So it's just kind of like uh, when you're doing the fetch, say when the fetch is finished, then say fetch finished, and then it will display that. And it's just a handy thing to do your loading. Again, React has brought that into their core as well. Uh, with that. Render triggered, this is a really handy thing. So render triggered is part of the life cycle now of web component. So this is a web component for Vue.js and you have these uh, different life cycle methods and now it's render triggered. So render triggered, when it triggers something to have to kind of new render again, it will run this function and you can kind of put like debugging information or, or you can put debugger there and say actually you rendered again, why did it? And you can kind of investigate it. Again, you can look at kind of performance improvements there. Again, that wasn't available in uh, view two. Fragments. Fragments is a handy one as well. I haven't had a, um, a use for it at the moment. But the thing is, with view is in your template section here, which is kind of figured out, is you need one root node or one root element. So you have a view instance and one root element. You have to have that connection. Sometimes, just for sake, you might have a wrapper node around or a wrapper element around your code just because Vue will complain about it. If you have like just these three elements here, input, span, p, and you don't have fragments around it, Vue will say you don't have a root element. You need to create one. Now, sometimes you just might create one just to have it, um, just to make it um, happy there. So. One thing is that you can do is you can wrap fragment around it. Again, fragment is a type that Vue understands now in Vue 3. Again, I had to use the Vue fragment. Again, it was a plugin, and um, you can import it, and that's how it kind of uh, is useful then. So again, this could be stuff for like the parent wants to be the wrap around three three like um, elements. So you don't want to have to do the wrapping yourself in this web component just for the sake of it. So as soon as this compiles, it gets rid of fragment. That doesn't appear in your HTML or any divs or any, anything there like so. So this is the kind of output of fragment as well. How it actually monitors which elements are together within the fragment is it has a fragment ID. So that's how you know. So we had three in the last one over here. So this, we had three elements. We had input, span, and that represented all those three elements. And then that's the output. So that's how fragments kind of monitor and uh, how they're connected together. Usually what, how they notice is it would have a div around them, and that's how it knows they're together. And it would have an ID on that div. So that's a kind of workaround then for it. Another change as well is vModel changes. Uh, so vModel changes is we have a parent here called settings. That's a component. And then we have a setting card, which is a child of uh, settings parent. So what I want to show you is how we would do that in view two is we would have, you can't, maybe you can't see it, is we would have one V model to do the username and then we would have two props to do email and location um, there. So then we would input that in and on this side then we would have, for the V model, we'd have to have a prop called value. So V model, um, has to, when you do vModel, you have to have a value in your custom 
component there. So then you would have to say, oh, I actually need more information that has to be reactive and two-way binding. So you have to create props, and then you have to create emitters then, or events. So here, I have to do props, and I have to call one of them value as well. So that's the only thing, and then I have to look after this. So again, it's a bit verbose, but then Evan Yu kind of seen that people wanted actual multiple vModel properties. Now you can name them. You can say vModel.username or colon username, vModel email, vModel location. And now they'll come in as actual props, username, email, location. Again, and all you have to do, though, is you have to emit a update and the name of the prop. And again, it will look after it and it will be reactive. Again, it's nicer code and it's more maintainable there. Another thing they've introduced as well is custom modifiers. So in Vue 2, you had custom modifiers like trim for your input. So you want to make sure it takes out the space. Or you might have lazy or, um, or number. So they kind of like modify the information when it's emitted up straight away. So now that you couldn't do it in Vue 2, but now you can do your own uh, modifier. So you can kind of go dot .reverse. And that's all that is is a prop. And you say, if dot .reverse is true, then when I admit the information, I'll actually reverse the information beforehand. Again, it's just a Boolean for you. So that's the kind of information. Another thing as well, I haven't really used it myself, is there's a new custom directive API. That's how you do directives in Vue 2. Now it's kind of following the way, the life cycle of an actual component in Vue uh, 3 and Vue 2. So again, you have in your component, and a normal one is before, mounted, before, update. That's that life cycle in Vue 3. But it was a bit confusing here. So I think Evan, you had thought, why don't we make component directed the same kind of life cycle? They're the same names, and people understand it from a web component. I haven't used it yet, but it's something like, I think this makes it easier for people to understand then. One other thing as well that's changed, and it might, uh, I haven't kind of tried it out yet because I don't have the compiler to kind of change .view files to outputs is view reactivity. So how view reactive works in view 2 is you have a data or you have a thing called touch like a data a reactive element called or a property called touch. When you create that it uses a thing called object.define property to get a setter and getter on it. And in the setter it will kind of weave in its own code to say when this is set notify people that are interested in when this changes. And this is the watcher. The watcher is kind of always kind of gets notified. That's that watcher section. Once it's kind of the setter is like you change that value of the touch property to something else, the watcher will be run. And the watcher will say, if you're watching this, then re-render. So we'll call the render function again. And that's how it kind of re-renders the stuff. So how it's changed in view 3, and you shouldn't see it really, um, is it's using the ES6 proxy. Before, it was using define, define properties. So again, one thing you should see, and I can't deny or, uh, or claim it's true, is you should see a performance improvement. That's what they're saying. I can't deny a uh, thing. So that's one thing. You might just, by upgrading to Vue 3, see a performance improvement then. So other things, just if you want to see the code base, it's there. I'm running out of time. Uh, Vue Amsterdam is in three weeks, if you want to go to it. Official View podcast by View Mastery there, if you want to keep up to date, and that's how I keep it. And that's all the questions I have then, okay?